Good morning, Access Church. Thanks for tuning in with us this morning. My name is Jessica Lewis, and I'm one of the worship leaders here at Access. My husband, Nate, and I are newer to the church. In fact, I only joined staff in March, just as the coronavirus was starting to ramp up in Houston. So many of you may have only seen me here online. And as much as we long to be together in church in person, Nate and I have so enjoyed these Sunday gatherings. We are so impressed with this church and so thankful for leadership that speaks to the difficult and important concerns of our day, like racism, politics, mental health challenges, and concerns over the spread of the virus. Today, we will begin with worship as we typically do. Amy and Christine will lead us in a couple of songs, and then we will have another collaborative effort by our members of our worship team, uh, and we will sing a song together called The Blessing. Throughout the ages, people have raised their voices in song as a proclamation of hope and to express resistance to evil and its schemes. Today, as we sing this blessing over our families and our children, let us also keep in mind our broader church community, our city, and especially those who are experiencing the effects of injustice. Let us raise our voices and pronounce a blessing upon our greater community and play a part in ushering in the kingdom of God. Andrew will be giving our announcements followed by Pastor Ted's message, which is called The Transforming Church. Pastor Ted is wrapping up our series on the church and culture, and he will be casting vision for what the church can be as we continue to pursue justice and racial righteousness. May God open our hearts this morning to see and to hear his voice as we are gathered today. Good morning and welcome to Access. We're so glad that we can worship together, um, even from a distance. Um, let me start with uh, introducing myself. My name is Amy Learn, and this is, I'm Christine. And um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being right where we are at. Um, God, would you be with us? Um, would you shine your light this morning on the things that you want us to see and know? Um, help us to stay connected with you and to worship you in Jesus' name. And just, I just want to invite you all right now to just spend a moment to connect with the Lord. Um, just right where you are, acknowledge his presence through a prayer or just saying, Hi, Jesus, um, just on your own, acknowledge his presence because we know that he is with us no matter where we are at. Now I want to invite you to praise God, to thank him for at least one thing just say that either out loud, right where you are, or silently in your heart. Praise God for at least one thing. Whatever it is that each one 
who is listening and watching this morning has laid before you, God, would you speak into that thing? Would you minister to their hearts this morning? And God, above all, help us to be connected to this truth that you still love us, God. That you still love us and we can hope and we can love because you loved us first. Let's sing this together. And he is jealous for me.
In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, I live in Shit. 
Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship this morning. That was great. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm part of the announcements team, and I have some updates, and I'll be highlighting upcoming events for you guys. If you're tuning in for the first time or new to Access, welcome. We'd love for you to fill out a Connect card online. That's the best way to stay up to date with what's going on at Access. After service, come hang out with us online. We'll have an opportunity to connect with one another as we'll discuss today's message. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. All are welcome. We have an online mission partner class coming up that Pastor John will be teaching. It will be happening on Sunday, July 12th from 1 to 3 p.m. This is for anyone interested in learning what it means to become a mission partner. This class covers who we are as a church, and what it looks like to grow as a follower of Jesus at Access. Please RSVP online by July 5th. We have a new series coming up. Next Sunday, we'll be starting a new sermon series called Waves and Anchors, The Church in Times of Uncertainty. During this pandemic, in times of social unrest, what does it look like for us to be God's people? We'll look at core aspects of our identity including our vision, 
mission, and values over the course of several weeks. We hope you'll tune in and invite a friend to watch. Parents, we have kids ministry program available on Sundays. Pre-K meets before our Sunday live stream and K through fifth meets after. Email Pastor Grace for links to join these wonderful classes. Now for our children's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And now let's prepare for a message from Pastor Ted. Thanks. Good morning. We are on the final message of a series that we started in the middle of May. We've been, we've been talking about the church and culture. And specifically over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the topic of justice, the church and justice. And this has been a very important topic for us to engage in as we've been living in the wake of several murders of black Americans, including the death of George Floyd. Well, today for our final message in this series, I'd like us to take a closer look at the vision of what the church can become. The vision that God gave us for how our lives could be lived together to be a countercultural force in this world to bring about transformation. You see, when Jesus came to live among us, when he dwelt among us, he took on the problems of sin and death. And the promise of God is this, if we believe by faith, we can enter into this new life. We are recreated from the inside out and God considers us a new creation. That's one of the basic messages of the church. But you see, the work of Jesus wasn't just for individuals. Collectively, as this took root, he also called us to a new way of life. And the church is more than just the collection of individuals. It is a collection of individuals who are living out the new kingdom way. As Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We're learning how to live new, a new way, to be new humans, to form a new community of faith. And this meant more than just a set of new rules. It was about life in the spirit that transformed the way things looked and appeared and it would eventually transform the world. So to help us engage in that more deeply today, we're going to be diving into the book of Philemon in the New Testament. It's one of the shortest letters in the New Testament, but it's a book, even though it's, it's not a very popular book, it's a book that we really need to pay attention today uh, because it's it's so full of wisdom for this moment that we're living through in history. There are so many lessons for us to pay close attention to, and it gives us, it gives us a model for how we can be the church in the days to come. So what I'd like us to do is read through the book of Philemon. I'll break it down into three chunks, and along the way, point out three transformations that happen in the life of the church. So, let's dive into the book of Philemon. Now, before we actually get started with the text, it's important to give some of the background history and the story that leads up to the letter. There's a background story that we need to know. So, first of all, who was Philemon? Philemon was a rich man, and along the way in his life, he heard the message of the gospel. He heard Paul preaching and telling the story of Jesus and hearing the invitation of God that if anyone believes in faith that Jesus came to take on sin and death, that they could be renewed. And so he became a Christian. And not only did he become a Christian, he became sold out for the way of God. Um, he offered up his home to be at the place where the new church would meet. So when you read through the book of Colossians in the New Testament, uh, 
That's actually the church that met in Philemon's house. They met there regularly to learn the way of Jesus and to begin practicing it. Now, Philemon was far from a perfect person. He had some things that he needed to work through. He was far from the way of God. And one of the things that we learn about Philemon was that he was a slave owner. Now, back in ancient Roman times, this was not necessarily uh, an odd thing. A lot of ancient Romans uh, owned slaves, especially if they were wealthy. And to make this distinction very clear, uh, slavery in ancient Rome was quite different than slavery in uh, early American life, uh, the early birth of the United States. It was quite different from the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, to be sure, uh, ancient Roman slavery was harsh and it was difficult, uh, but there were stories of slaves that eventually bought their freedom because they could earn a wage, and it didn't last for generations like it did with the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, that type of slavery that we talked about a few weeks ago was very heavily based upon race. Now, it's not my intention to get into all the specifics of that. It's worth a message maybe some other time. But suffice it to say, Philemon needed some work in his life. Now, one of Philemon's slaves was a man named Onesimus. Onesimus, actually. That's how you pronounce it in the Greek, Onesimus. I had to practice that a bunch of times before preaching today. But Onesimus was a slave with a difficult history with Philemon because one day he decided to run away. He left Philemon's household, and on the way out, he stole things. Uh, we're not given the specifics of what he took. Maybe it was some possessions, maybe it was some money, but Philemon stole from Onesimus. I mean, Onesimus stole from Philemon. Now, there's another twist in this story. Onesimus went to the city of Ephesus, and he also heard the message of the gospel. He encountered Paul, and as he heard about this new life offer from God and how he could be renewed, he believed. He became a Christian, and his life radically began to change. Now, as a, an escaped slave, Onesimus, Onesimus had the option to go anywhere he wanted, and he spent his free time visiting Paul in prison. In fact, he began to visit Paul regularly. He was his supporter. So when Paul needed things like supplies to write letters to churches or to deliver things, Onesimus was right there. When he needed someone, a companion to spend time with, Onesimus was right there. They became such good friends that Paul eventually called him his son. And this was very significant because Paul didn't have a biological family that he could lean on. He wasn't married. He didn't have aunts and uncles and mom and dad to, to lean on. He was, when he was in prison, he was alone. And Onesimus became his spiritual son in the faith. Now, this is where the letter begins to take shape. Because these two men came to faith, and yet they were still not reconciled. The letter to Philemon is Paul's attempt to bring reconciliation and peace to these two men. And he does it in a very challenging way by calling these men to a higher standard. So let's get right into the text and let's read from Philemon chapter 1. Paul a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share 
for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in prison, was I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. A quick note needs to be said here about the final verses of that first section. Paul talks about usefulness, and it's a play on words because Onesimus, the name means useful. And formerly, he didn't live up to his name. He wasn't very useful in Philemon's household. But in Christ, all of a sudden, Onesimus became very useful. He was so useful to Paul in a sense that Paul called him a son. But here we encounter the very first transformation, what I call the transformation of power. See, Paul could have made his appeal to Philemon in two different ways. He had two options. The first option was to appeal out of his apostolic authority. God had given Paul apostolic authority. Paul had the uh, power and the position to lay down rules for how the early church could function. He had the authority to call people out when they were doing wrong. Uh, and sometimes he needed to do this. In some of the other letters that you read in the New Testament, that's exactly what Paul does. Because sometimes he has to come up against people who were false teachers. There were times when he came up against people who were uh, wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing. There are people who came in to take advantage of people in the church and tried to lead them astray, taking advantage of widows, for instance. Paul needed to exercise his apostolic authority at times to rebuke people and to put them in line. But this was a different case because he knew Philemon and Philemon knew him. They were close friends. And so he says, Rather than appeal out of my apostolic authority, I appeal to you on the basis of love. Now, love, to be sure, is also about power. But it's a very different kind of power. It's not a power that comes against somebody's will. It's a power that walks alongside of, lifts somebody up, empowers, and gives Philemon the option to flourish. It gives Philemon the option to move ahead and to grow. Now, we're familiar with these different types of power in our relationships. You know, uh, recently, Amy and I celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary. Uh, so 24 years ago, we recited wedding vows to one another, and we did so out of love. Out of love, I declared um, I was going to honor and respect and treat Amy faithfully. And likewise, out of love, she recited her wedding vows to me. And we can all agree today that wedding vows need to be spoken out of love, not out of compulsion, not because someone forces you. They are vows made in love, a commitment bonded in love. Uh, we understand these different types of uh, use of power in parenting, for example, right? Now, sometimes as a parent, we need to exercise parental authority and position, right? So when my kids were really young, um, Amy and I had to lay down the ground rules for our household. Um, and we told them things like no hitting, no lying, no stealing. These were just basic ground rules for how our household functioned. Um, and as the, grew, as the kids grew older, we didn't need to keep repeating these things, but they were very part of their formation. But love operates differently. And if a household is only known for what it stands against or the rules for do not do this, 
it becomes a very harsh place to dwell in, right? It becomes a very harsh household. Uh, so my younger daughter Mia, uh, when she this when she was younger, she used to get up from every dinner, and in the middle of dinner, she would give her mid meal hugs. She would go around to person to person. She would hug her sister. She would hug her mom. She would hug her dad, and then she would sit back down. It was just an expression of love. And she didn't do it just to get like more dessert or an extra helping. Uh, she just did it because she felt affection and wanted to love us. You see, that kind of behavior doesn't come uh, out of a command or because uh, she's being forced to. It's the action of love. And we can understand that there's these different dynamics in how we relate to people. And Paul is choosing to use love to teach Philemon a new way to live. So why is this important and why do we need to pay attention to it today? Well, first of all, in the letter itself, Paul is about to ask Philemon some really challenging things. And these are things that need to come from love and not just because Philemon is being forced into it. We'll get to that in just a moment. But it's important for us to talk about because the justice of God is different from the justice that we simply operate by in the justice system or the legal system. The justice of God is transformative in a sense. It is meant to change us. And the justice of God operates at a higher level. And if we want to see people and society and institutions change for the better, we have to make sure that we are grounded in love. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, talked about it in this way in one of his books, uh, The Strength uh, to Love. He writes, with every ounce of our energy, we must continue to rid this nation of the incubus of segregation. But we shall not in the process relinquish our privilege and our obligation to love. While abhorring segregation, we shall love the segregationist. This is the only way to create the beloved community. So Dr. King had this vision for what he called the beloved community. It was a vision for how society could function, both honoring people of all different colors and different backgrounds, uh, yet being a just society at the same time. But in order to get to that vision, he understood that it couldn't just happen uh, thinking through things in an us versus them kind of perspective. Uh, if he was only hating his enemies, it would just drive them further into their position. But if he could teach people to love, it opened up a whole new world of possibilities. And this was a tall order to ask the people of his day. To bring you back into the days of desegregation in the United States, we have to remember that that period of history was violent. It was oppressive. It was very dark. White supremacists were bombing black churches. They were bombing black uh, households. There were shootings. Um, uh, the police were using dogs on children. It was a terrible nightmare of a time in the United States. And yet, Dr. King was calling for his movement to operate by love. The question is, where did he get this vision? And how could he call people to this? This, of course, came from Jesus. This is the way of the kingdom of God. When we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done, we're praying in a sense and moving in a sense to align ourselves with the way of Jesus which calls us not only to love the people who will love us in return, but to love our enemies. And in that dynamic, we were hoping to see love transform our enemies into people who also align 
with the way of God. Now, going back to the text, let's uh, look again at the book of Philemon and pay attention to the next transformation. Philemon, verses 12 to 16. I am sending him, that's Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me a while. I am in chain for the gospel. But I do not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. The second transformation is the transformation of identity. The transformation of identity. Paul makes a, a couple of really difficult requests, and this is where he makes them. Uh, and to be clear, there's actually two requests. There's one that comes before the writing of the letter, and there's one that we just read about in the letter to uh, Philemon. So the first one actually comes to Onesimus, because he is calling Onesimus, who has fled from his slave master, to go back to him. That's crazy. Onesimus is free. He can do what he wants. He doesn't have to do this. And Philemon, by Roman law, has the right to pursue legal action against him. He could have him put in jail. He could have him put in chains. And so this is a very risky thing that he's asking him to do. But in the same way, you see, Paul is asking Philemon to do something very challenging. He's asking him to forgive, in a sense, and to take Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as an equal. Someone who's raised in his social status. Someone that he is going to have to love because he is also part of the church, part of the kingdom of God. This is radical transformation. Now, there's a couple of things that are really important for us to understand in terms of theology. Because what Paul is doing is he's drawing on some deep theology in order to help these men come together in peace. You see, uh, the Bible describes that when a person comes to faith in Jesus, they are a new creation. They are renewed from the inside out. The old is gone, the new has come. And God doesn't see us the way we were in the past. He sees us in a brand new light. We are now considered children of God. And the challenge of the church is this. It is begin, beginning to see people not just as they were, and not just by their physical trappings, but through the eyes of God. And through the eyes of God, we are being called to see stranger as friend, to see enemy as brother and sister. This radical transformation is what we try to live into at Axis when we talk about the faith village. This is the deep theology of the church. This is about the kingdom of God. So why is this important? Why are we considering this today? Well, in our nation today and in this moment in history, we're going through a lot of deconstruction. And it's not just the deconstruction of like statues and of physical objects. We're going through some deconstruction of culture and of cultural thought and perspectives. And this is very valuable. And I think even though it's difficult, it's actually very good for us because we're uncovering some racist messages that have embedded themselves into our culture and into the way that people think. One of those perspectives is that black lives don't matter as much as white lives. And that's why that phrase needs to be repeated because culturally, 
institutionally, even structurally, that's been the case. Uh, we've seen that in some things in history, such as um, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, like the Three-Fifths Compromise, where, uh, where black human beings weren't counted as fully as white human beings, right? Or like uh, the Dred Scott trial, uh, where, a, uh, where a slave brought his case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that black people didn't uh, didn't qualify for the rights of the Constitution. But this is not only about black lives. This is about people of color in general. And for Asian Americans, this has been the case. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen some of those videos that have been very upsetting of people who've launched into racist tirades. One of them happened in my old neighborhood in Torrance in California, where a woman launched into a tirade against several people of Asian background. And her messaging was this. You don't belong. Go home. Get out of this country. You see, that wasn't a new message. That's actually been a long-lived message. I recently listened to a, a lecture online that compared uh, racism against Black Americans versus racism against Asian Americans. And it's been interesting to compare and contrast the two. Whereas racism and oppression against uh, black Americans has been to call them less than, racism against Asians is that you are other. You don't belong. This is not your home and this is not your country. And this is very difficult for many of us to hear who have been born here, who have been raised here, and many of us have invested our lives in this country. So those racist messages need to be unraveled. And what the church has the opportunity to do here in this moment is to speak about the kingdom way of Jesus. That we no longer live simply by these old identities and by these cultural perspectives. That in Christ, we are brothers, we are sisters, we belong to one another. And this is how it could look like in my life. You see, I'm Ted. I grew up in California. I moved to Texas. I have an Asian American background. My parents were from Hong Kong. But even though I have that part of my history, what's more important is that you know me as a baptized member of the faith. I am baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I am a new creation. I am loved by Jesus. I am redeemed, and I am included in the kingdom of God. Theologians have a way of encapsulating this thought. They call it our baptismal identity. And our baptismal identities is something that a lot of theologians are using now to talk about our race relationships, that our baptismal identity within the church must begin to take precedent if we are begin if we are to move forward. All right, finally, let's move on to the third part of Philemon and talk about one final transformation. Philemon, verses 17 to the end of the book. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask, and one thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored uh, to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you readings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The last transformation is the transformation of debt. The transformation of debt. 
Now, as you follow, have been following along in the story and you've been listening to it along the way, I don't know if you've felt a little bit of uneasiness around the story of Philemon. Because, in a sense, there's a little bit of unfairness going on. He has had property stolen from him, and now he's being asked just to forget about it, right? If you've ever had anything stolen from you, you kind of know that, that sense of anger that you can have. I've had my wallet stolen from me a, a number of different times, and it is a frustrating uh, experience to notice, first of all, that it's missing, then to call the credit card company and know that someone just went on a shopping spree at your expense, spent a thousand dollars on things, and then you have to replace all the different things that go with that, like your driver's license and more. It's a really frustrating experience and uh, it can really lead to a sense of anger. And Philemon is being asked here to forgive Onesimus for stealing and to forgive him for this crime. So how is this fair? Well, it's not actually fair, and it doesn't really add up in the general ledger of things. But here's the thing that really speaks of the gospel and the way of the kingdom. Paul steps in himself to make things right. He says, you know, whatever Onesimus owes you, charge it to me. I'm going to make it right. And to be clear, these uh, New Testament letters were read in front of a community. They were read to entire churches. And so when Paul made this promise and this pledge, it was read to the entire community. So they all knew that Paul was making good on his word. Paul was linking his reputation on Onesimus. And he was saying, look, if he owes you anything, I'll make it right. Now, why is this last point important? Why do we need to pay attention to it today, this whole transformation of debt? Well, first of all, we as Christians and we as the church are called to be peacemakers. And sometimes the way to peace is a costly one. It will cost us something. It will cost us the sense of getting involved into messy situations, time, effort, even money. Paul didn't have to get involved in this messy relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. He didn't have to do it, but he did. He inserted himself. He used his authority. He wrote a letter. He spent time and energy. He, he challenged people. And then he put his money into it. Whatever Onesimus owed, he would pay the bill. Sometimes the work of peacemaking will require us to dive into chaos and mess and get ourselves involved into some unpleasant situations. But the goal of this is to live out the kingdom way. God is calling us to something higher. And as we participate in this, as we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, and as we enter into these messy situations, we are living, in a sense, the very presence of Christ to our world. This is the way of Jesus. There's another insight I want to point out here, too. And this is for maybe some of you who are newer to the church, or maybe you've just kind of stumbled upon this video, you've heard about it, or maybe a friend invited you to join our worship gathering today. And you're kind of wondering to yourself, well, how in the world did Paul even think of this solution for Philemon and Onesimus? Well, it comes from none other than Jesus. This is essentially the way of Jesus. Again, the, the message of the Bible is that we were created in the image of God. But early on in the story of humanity, we rebelled against God. And sin and death became our new reality. We walked away from God. But God didn't give up on us. He sent his son Jesus to teach us about the kingdom, to die for our sin, and to bring us back into new life. 
And the invitation of God is this. If you believe by faith, you too can be part of this new kingdom. And I want to make this offer to you as we wrap up this series. Maybe for you, you've been following along, but you haven't personally entered in. I'm going to put up a prayer at the, uh, in just a moment. I'm going to invite you to pray it quietly to yourself. This could be your new first steps of faith, and I invite you to join in. If you just pray that prayer um, on the board, really invite you to follow up by emailing staff at accesslive.org. We would absolutely love to walk with you in your new journey of faith and help, help you figure out your next steps on this Christian journey. Now, as we wrap up our series as a whole, and as we conclude our church and culture messages, I invite us to pray our sending prayer in faith, to really pray this and remember in this prayer that we are a redeemed people. We have a baptismal identity and we don't go forth into the new challenge that this world presents, um, having to fear what the world presents. We can go forth with the confidence that God is with us, that his life transforming work is moving in us to transform the world around us. Let's pray this together. Loving God, through all our years, let the church be a community where we learn about love and practice it, where we envision peace and work to build it, where we meet partners in faith who wish to abandon everything that cheapens our discipleship, where we discover gifts and offer them. May your spirit guide us toward joy and generosity. In Jesus' name, in the way of Jesus, amen.